a bunch of questions. Um, as as um, I think I'll ask one question myself and then I'll get into the uh, Sligo questions. And this is really for all of you. Just one thing that is a constant fascination is, is how you support other organizations and individuals to build services or visualizations or whatever it may be, you know, make use of the open data that, that you produce and, and, and where you, you know, what you do yourselves and how much that's a core part of each of your sort of initiatives versus of letting people just put it out there and letting people do what they will with it. Who wants to take that first? Sruti maybe? Or? Sure. Um, so I'd say like we do two main things. One, I think because uh, the, the platform is open source, it enables people to like see what already exists. And we've already seen lots of examples of people uh, building tools on top of it. Like uh, we had, like I mentioned, there's like the R and Python API wrapper. There's also um, a, uh, a QA QC tool uh, that makes it easy to develop or check the uh, quality of the data. Um, and so well, like making it open source enables people from around uh, around the world to be able to uh, contribute and kind of make it their own. Uh, and the other thing that we try to do is through the workshops. Um, we the Ghana workshop that we did. Um, there were several people um, that had their own organizations organization that was setting up air quality monitors around the country, um, and we were able to kind of use the global community and network that we have to share the great work that they're doing, um, and that was kind of how they got contacted by Columbia, um, and we wrote an impact story about them recently, um, which has also gotten some attention, and uh, there are a couple of other impact stories that will be coming out with um, over the course of the year to kind of showcase what people in the community are doing um, and help amplify the work that they're doing. Awesome, thank you. Paul and Neil, same so question to you. I mean, how, how much is supporting people to use your data and services at a core part of your work? Do you want to speak to that initially, Neil? Yeah, uh, let, me, let me make one or two points and then I'll, I'll let you uh, speak on that as well. Um, in terms of people using the data, there's a number of different levels at which we have to look at it. Um, the first is just non-programmatic access, which is actually something that a lot of lawyers need because they're only looking for four or five cases. And very often there, they'll just contact us and ask for help um, and, we, and we help where we can. Uh, with programmatic access, there's a sort of more advanced access for people who know how to use APIs and how to consume them. And over there, the focus in how I've been building the APIs is really to try and make them as self-documenting as possible so that people can navigate them. Um, but very often, again, you get people who can only really work with an Excel sheet or a text export or something like that. And so we do have to accommodate that as well, and we try to as much as possible. I think the big sort of balance that we have to make is that, again, we, we're a foundational publisher. We publish the, the source documents, the original sources, and we don't want to make predictions about what can and can't be done with that in a way that it restricts people um, in the tools that we make available. And so I think the first priority is always making sure that the stuff is accessible and that if people have an idea that it might not be something that we anticipated, that they are still able to do it. And then beyond that, we start engaging with organizations individually to see, okay, what are your specific needs and can we build out something else for that? And just to add to that, something that we've recently, or rather African League recently initiated is we have a constant surveying now on all of the sites, which are partly a dip test to understand who are using the sites and what impact that it's having so that we can understand if the changes and additions that we make are having the impacts that we hope but also it means that we have a way of interrogating our user base in much more detail so we can learn from them better what tools or features we can add to the existing sites in order for them to be able to function more effectively and to be able to use the data that are available Mm. Oh, sorry, there was it sounded like a motorbike going by, or maybe a moped, just as you started speaking, Mark. Yeah, so um, a question from David Newman, uh, just how usable are African leads compared with equivalent commercial services? 
I mean, we clearly have some bias in, in on this subject. I will let, I will make an initial comment and then let Neil follow up. One critically important thing that the Leaves do and which is in the process of being rolled out is that they acknowledge the fact that not everyone has a stable or cost effective internet connection and actually more specifically it can be unusual to get an internet connection if you're sitting in a court of law so African Lee have created something uh, I'm, Neil can correct me if I'm wrong but uniquely to their service which the commercial providers don't have which is called pocket law which is the entire corpus of law uh, on a thumb drive, which then can update when the users get internet access. And crucially for those people who are in slightly more remote areas or simply can't afford high bandwidth fees, it means that they actually have a far superior product to the ones that are available to them from the commercial services. But there's some other functionality things, including Citata that Neil can talk to in more detail. So Neil, anything to add or? It's, it's funny, Paul should say what he did, because I was thinking as well as a developer who's worked on the site, perhaps I can't comment on how good it is, but uh, without, yeah, without significant... This is an opportunity to see how great your work is. <laughs> this, is the, this is the place for it. So uh, what, what I will say with usability, I, I'm well aware of the difficulty of using the commercial sites, uh, because I studied law myself and I had to use them for, for four years, and it, and it was a bit of a, a serious struggle. We take UX seriously. It's not a tick box for us. We do our testing and we bring in experts to have a look at usability and what we can do with that. We have had some challenges on the main site. We're now upgrading that to a new Drupal version and we've got in UX people again to, to look at the user flows and to test them and to make sure people aren't getting stuck on the site. And certainly on the site data as well, we've done a lot of testing and there's, a, there's ongoing feedback as Paul also mentioned, the, the surveys on the sites uh, to year where people are having trouble. So we are resource constrained, but as far as possible, we're getting feedback and, and we're doing, we take it very seriously that, that these things need to be usable, especially as well, since, you know, many of our users are, are like judges who are normally older people and who prefer tables and faxes and, and pieces of paper. Uh, and we have people as well who are experts at working with judges and their needs and what they're used to. And we designed for that as well. I just want an anecdotal example. I had last year, I had a meeting with the head of chambers of a large law firm in Johannesburg. And I went in thinking, he's never going to have heard of Safley. And when I mentioned it, his eyes brightened. He said, oh, I use it every single day. And literally picked up a, a case, massive case file from his desk that had been printed out from Safley. Even though he had access to all the commercial services, he found it easier and better for his needs in many circumstances than those commercial providers. That's great to hear. So a couple of questions for Sruti. Um, so Matt Stempek asked uh, the best examples you've seen of citizens of civil society using air quality data. You may have covered some of that already. And then there's a follow-up question as well just about how does air quality data collected by satellites compare with data collected by detectors on the ground? So a couple of questions there. Sure. Um, so yeah, in terms of uh, impacts that, or examples that we've seen, um, I mentioned the, the Ghana story. Uh, there's also a workshop that we did in Sarajevo uh, where uh, because we bring together people from different sectors, uh, there was actually an activist and a local government official who um, I think previously had been at odds with each other, but like during the workshop kind of were able to find common ground um, and they actually um, drafted a community statement uh, and were able to put together a plan and they presented it before um, before the parliament um, and they were able to um, kind of help start make some change. The thing is, you know, as uh, as we saw with the Beijing story, um, you know, having the data is like the first step and there's lots you can do with the, the data, um, but actual um, regulatory change takes a long time. Um, and so, uh, like having the data and like being able to visualize it and share stories um, and, and like make and start that conversation is, is, uh, is really important and it's a good first step. You, what's your funding model? I mean, do you charge for access to the data in some circumstances or are you fund it elsewhere? What, how, how do you operate? Yeah, most of our funding comes in from grants. We also have like certain partnerships uh, where we work with organizations that are using the data, but for the, for the most part, like the data is completely free and open for anybody to access. Yeah. And uh, for, sorry, I just realized I didn't answer that follow-up question. Um, so I 
am a software engineer, I don't have enough of an atmospheric sciences background to answer that question. Um, but I know that um, uh, like via satellites, um, you can get some uh, obfuscation, I guess, uh, due to like weather, weather events. But I think somebody with a uh, like background would be able to answer that question better. Excellent. So we're a little bit out of time. There are a few questions still uh, to, to ask, but as, as you probably heard, we'll send questions around to each of the speakers if they want to do any follow-up. Thank you so much, all of you. That was a really fantastic session.